Hello, I'm Dr. John Kavanaugh, and this is still AJS 101, Introduction to Criminal Justice, and now we're on Lesson 3, Part 2. Let's talk about the general categories of law. Now, an offense is any breaking of the criminal law, and offenses can be violations, misdemeanors, and felonies. A felony is a serious breaking of the law, which has a penalty of incarceration in a prison, and prisons are run by the state. And that's for over a year, although some felonies can have death as a penalty if they are capital offenses. Although some felons may just get probation, a fine, community service, or, or some combination of those. And there are many degrees of seriousness for different felonies. Uh, in fact, uh, most states have five or six different levels of felonies. On the other hand, a misdemeanor is a less serious breaking of the law which has a penalty of incarceration for a year or less in a jail. And a jail is a uh, place of incarceration run by county or local governments. Although some misdemeanants, in fact, in fact most misdemeanants, don't go to jail. They get a fine, community service, or, or some combination of a non-incarceration penalty. And there are usually two or three degrees of misdemeanors. Finally, a violation, also called an infraction, is a minor breaking of the law, punishable by a short jail stay or a fine. By the way, jail stays are very rare for violations, uh, unless the person keeps committing the same violation because they find it easier to, uh, to pay the fine than comply with the law. Uh, loitering, disorderly conduct, uh, most traffic infractions, jaywalking, these are all examples of violations. Treason is a special category of federal crime where a U.S. citizen helps a foreign enemy to harm the United States. Uh, many states also have treason laws. We do not get too many of these prosecutions. Espionage related to treason is the gathering of national defense information about the United States to a foreign power uh, or enemy of the United States. Uh, espionage is also called spying. Again, not too many of these cases, almost always handled by federal authorities, the FBI. All right, let's talk about a whole new group of offenses called inchoate offenses. Now, an inchoate offense is an offense begun but not completed. Uh, an attempt to commit a crime is an inchoate offense, and inchoate offenses are usually one level of seriousness less than the crime itself. Let me give you an example. Uh, Let's say that you want to harm somebody, so you throw a rock at them. You intentionally throw a rock at them to injure them. Now, that would usually be a felony assault because it's an assault, it's an assault with a weapon, or in this case, a dangerous instrument, a rock, uh, which is capable of causing serious physical injury. But if the rock misses the person because you're a bad aim or the person ducks, then you did not complete the felony assault. But that doesn't mean that you're not guilty of anything because what you have committed is the inchoate offense of attempted, uh, attempt to commit a felony, which would be a, an assault, which would be one degree lower than the crime had the actual assault occurred. Um, another example of an inchoate offense is conspiracy. Conspiracy is agreeing with one or more people to commit a crime. Usually an overt act is required to complete the crime of conspiracy because talk is cheap. So two people get together and they decide, two or more people get together and they decide that they want to rob a bank. Well, if they sit down and they plan the robbery, the time, the place, uh, who's going to, uh, you know, bring what equipment, uh, that's agreeing to commit a crime. But in almost every jurisdiction, you still don't have the conspiracy offense because talk is cheap. They could just be BSing. They may never go beyond talking. So usually an overt act that furthers the conspiracy is required to complete the crime of conspiracy. Uh, that overt act is something that furthers the crime. It can be a legal or illegal act. So uh, if they were going to rob a bank and just one of them went into a store and bought face masks, 
uh, ski, ski masks, uh, that would be an overt act that furthered the conspiracy. And you would now have a complete conspiracy and all of the people could be found guilty of conspiracy to, you know, to commit grand larceny or robbery, whatever they were, whatever they were, they were talking about. So the covert act, the overt act can be legal or illegal. Uh, so two or more people agree to commit a crime. One of them commits an overt act. You then have conspiracy to commit whatever the crime is. The penalty one level lower than the crime had the crime actually been completed. Of course, if they commit the crime, there's no conspiracy. They're charged with the actual crime, which is a, a higher level of liability. Let's talk about the general features of crime. A criminal act consists of the criminal act, which in Latin is called the actus reus, and the criminal mind, which in Latin is called the mens rea. And there also has to be concurrence, a link between the two. So we're talking about criminal act or actus reus plus criminal mind or mens rea linked by concurrence and you have somebody guilty of a crime. The criminal act or the actus reus is the act prohibited by law. So stealing is the actus reus of larceny. Causing physical injury to another is the actus reus of uh, assault. Uh, killing a person is the actus reus of murder, etc., etc., etc. Now, the actus reus must be a voluntary act. So, sleepwalking, um, acts done while you're in a seizure, um, acts done while you're unconscious, and status offenses cannot be actus reus. For example, uh, if a person is an epileptic and they go into a grand mal seizure where their arms and legs are thrashing around and uh, a person comes over to help them and tries to cushion their head as they're lying down and the person having the seizure's arm comes up and causing his hand to strike the person in the nose and break the rescuer's nose, that would not be an assault because that was done during a seizure and it was not a conscious act. And in addition, status offenses cannot be actus reus. Uh, decades ago, uh, one southern state attempted to make it a crime to be addicted to drugs. Now, the, now being a drug addict is not an act, it's a condition. You get there by performing the illegal acts of consuming illegal drugs, or it could be legal drugs actually, uh, but becoming an addict is not actus reus. It's a status. And you can't punish somebody for the status. You can punish somebody for buying illegal drugs. You can punish somebody for uh, injecting illegal drugs into their system. But you cannot publish uh, punish somebody for their status as a drug addict. So actus reus has to be a voluntary act. Omissions can be actus reus when the omission is mandated by law. So for example, um, Failing to file your income taxes is not doing an act. It's failing to do an act. But the law says that can actually be a legal actus reus because it's mandated by law and you didn't do it. So uh, again, examples of uh, omission actus reus would be not fail filing your income tax. Or if you're a parent, it would be uh, not caring for your children, giving them food or medical care and the like. Okay, now let's talk about the criminal mind or the mens rea in Latin. The mens rea is the guilty mind, and it refers to the mental state of mind of the actor when the crime was committed. And there are four mens rea. Purposely, which is in some states called intentionally, knowingly, recklessly, and negligently. Now, purposely, again, also called intentionally, in that case, the actor's conscious objective was to do the act or cause the result. So I want you injured, so I intentionally right, pick up a baseball bat and hit you on the head. Right? My conscious objective was to injure you, so I would have been acting purposely or intentionally when I did that. Another mens rea is knowingly. And here, the actor was aware of the circumstances. And this is usually used in possession cases. It's pretty much the same as intentionally or purposely, but again, you use it for possession of illegal substances. 
possession of illegal drugs, stolen property, uh, things like that. Uh, the next two are recklessly and negligently, and these are fairly similar. In recklessly, the actor engaged in unjustified behavior that created a substantial risk of causing death or serious injury to another person, knowing that that risk was present. Okay, so think about this now. You engage in unjustified behavior that creates a substantial risk of causing death or serious injury to somebody else, and you know that risk is present and you do it anyway. Let's break down these terms. First, the behavior has to be unjustified. Um, behavior which creates a substantial risk of causing death or serious injury to somebody might be shooting them. But let's say you're a police officer or a civilian and somebody is attacking you illegally using deadly physical force. Someone's trying to kill you. Well, if you kill them or shot them in self-defense, that would be a justified act. So uh, you would not, in this case, uh, be subject to uh, any kind of criminal liability. So um, let's get back to recklessly. The actor engaged in unjustified behavior that creates a substantial risk of causing death or injury to another. Uh, let me give you an example of that. Uh, you, you're up on uh, the roof of an apartment building, six-story apartment building, and somebody had discarded a, an old bowling ball. And you pick it up and you say, wow, wouldn't it be cool if I dropped this bowling ball off of the, this six-story roof onto the sidewalk below to watch it scatter, you know, break into a million pieces? It'd be so cool. So you take the bowling ball over to the side of the building, over the, the entrance exit sidewalk, and you drop the bowling ball. And just as you let go, somebody walks out of the door, the bowling ball hits them and kills them. Uh, let's see uh, what is your mens rea. Well, did you intentionally try to kill them? No. So you could not be charged with intentionally killing somebody. You wanted to see the bowling ball drop. You didn't want for anybody to get hit. So it's not murder, which is intentionally killing somebody. So the question is, did you act recklessly or negligently? Because in negligently, it's the same thing as in recklessly, but in negligently, the actor failed to perceive the risk when a reasonable person should have perceived it. So getting back to our example, uh, you drop the bowling ball. Was that a justified act? No, there, there's no legal justification for dropping a bowling ball. So you have unjustified behavior. So the next question is, did that create a substantial risk of causing death or serious injury to somebody else? And the answer is, of course. You dropped it onto a sidewalk that uh, that abutted the entrance and exit to the building. At any point, somebody could have exited this large six-story apartment building, which has many residents. So you didn't, and of course, if a bowling ball hits somebody going down six stories, you are going to kill them or really hurt them badly. So you engaged in unjustified behavior and it created a substantial risk of causing death or serious injury. Now, the key question here is, did you know the risk to be present? Because if you knew the risk to be present, then you would have acted reckless, recklessly. Uh, so your defense lawyer would probably have to establish that you were really dim-witted uh, and just really didn't perceive that risk uh, in order to avoid being charged with recklessly killing somebody, which is manslaughter and can get you some serious prison time. But again, you would have acted negligently if you failed to perceive the risk when a reasonable person should have perceived it. So if a reasonable person should have perceived that risk, and obviously a reasonable person would, and your lawyer can convince the court that you failed to perceive it, then you are not reckless, but you are negligent then you would be charged with criminally negligent homicide and you know would probably get three to five years in prison because even that's a serious crime because you killed somebody. Now, of course, these mens rea apply to all crimes, right? So you intentionally kill somebody, it's murder. You might recklessly kill somebody. Uh, if it was uh, New Year's Eve and you fired a uh, pistol round into the air and it wound up uh, hitting somebody uh, in, in that same apartment building because you were standing outside, that would be, uh, you know, uh, that would be a recklessly, uh, not kill if you injured somebody, that would be recklessly uh, causing serious injury to somebody, and, and that would be a form of assault. Uh, 
if you uh, drag race on a residential street and you're doing 80 miles an hour, you know, where at any point a car could back out of a driveway or a kid could cross the street and you hit and injured a child, uh, you would have recklessly caused uh, serious physical injury and that would be a serious assault charge. So that's how these work. Uh, most people commit intentional crimes. They intentionally steal property, so they're guilty of larceny. Uh, let's move on. Let's talk about strict liability. Now remember, in normal situations, you have to have the mens rea, the actus reus, and linkage between the two. So you intentionally stole something. Mens rea, actus reus, you know, you wanted to, you know, do it for stealing, there's a connection, you're guilty of larceny. However, there are some situations uh, where we call, we have strict liability crimes. So again, for most crimes, both the actus reus and mens rea must be present for liability. But in a small number of crimes, only the actus reus is needed for, for there to be criminal liability. And these are called crimes of strict liability. Now, strict liability crimes usually involve public welfare issues where it would be dangerous or disruptive to excuse such behavior, behavior even when done accidentally. So these strict liability crimes include most traffic offenses, health code violations, and building code violations. Let me give you an example. Uh, a lot of people speed accidentally. Uh, a lot of people speed because they don't really realize that they're going that much faster than the speed limit. So it would be very difficult for a police officer to prove that somebody intentionally speeded. So, and recognizing that, we just make it, you're guilty if you're speeding. No mens rea, no intent. If you're over the limit, you're guilty. You can be issued a summons. You'll, you'll be found guilty in court. Uh, another example would be health code violations. Uh, you run a restaurant. And uh, for those of you that have food handlers cards know, uh, you have to store food that can spoil because of bacterial growth uh, at 40 degrees or below in a refrigerator. If the refrigerator is at a higher temperature, uh, you can wind up uh, having the food spoil. And if you serve it to people, they'll get food poisoning. So if they, now, if, if, you're, if in your restaurant, your refrigerator breaks down and you don't know this, you have no way of knowing this, but the health inspector comes in as inspecting, and when the health inspector checks the temperature, it's found to be at 45 degrees. Even though you didn't know the refrigerator was malfunctioning, you will be guilty of that health code violation. Because we want to uh, penalize people whether they know or not, because we don't want the public to get sick. So the message is, if you own a restaurant, you better frequently check your refrigerator to make sure it's working, because we're going to hold you liable no matter what. Because the good news is that these, these strict liability uh, offenses are almost always violations and they don't really involve any kind of incarceration. It's really just fines. So those are strict liability offenses. And finally, uh, let's talk about how we put this all together in terms of the elements of a specific crime. Now, the elements of a crime are the basic components that make it a crime and also any aggravating factors that might raise this degree of seriousness. At a minimum, the elements include mens rea and actus reus, unless we're talking about a strict liability crime. So let's talk about homicide offenses. And by the way, uh, there is no actual crime of homicide. Homicide is the general title for a collection of crimes that where the, somebody dies. So it's murder, manslaughter, and criminally negligent homicide are the homicide offenses. Some states have death by auto uh, as a homicide offense. But again, that's a category of specific crimes. So let's see how the mens rea is and aggravating factors or mitigating factors, which lessen the degree of seriousness or penalty, interact in a specific crime. So murder is the intentional killing of a human being. So the mens rea is what? Intentional. The actus reus is killing a human being. So there we see the two come together for the crime of murder. A lesser homicide offense is manslaughter. Manslaughter is intentionally killing a human being in the heat of passion or other emotional uh, distress. So again, same mens rea, intentionally, same actus reus, killing a human being, but here 
It's not murder, it's the lesser crime of manslaughter because there is a mitigating factor. You did it in the heat of passion or other emotional upset. And an example would be, uh, you get off early from work one night, you come home and unexpectedly, and you discover uh, your spouse uh, in bed with somebody else. You are enraged at this infidelity and you take out your gun and you shoot and kill both of them. Now, did you intentionally kill somebody? Yes, you did. You, you, your conscious objective was to kill them and you killed them. So you, you, that would normally be murder. However, the courts recognize that in this unusual circumstance, you were probably under considerable uh, emotional uh, upsetness, which clouded your thinking and reduces your liability. So we would reduce that to manslaughter. Uh, not on the slide, but another example would be if you recklessly kill somebody. Remember I said drag racing on a residential street and somebody walks across and you hit and kill them? Uh, the mens rea there would be recklessly. You didn't intend to kill them, but you were engaging in an extremely dangerous, unjustified behavior, which created a substantial risk of killing somebody. So that's recklessly and you killed somebody. Uh, that would be the crime of uh, manslaughter uh, also. Uh, so you see how that interacts also. Then we have a lower level homicide called criminally negligent homicide, and that is negligently killing a human being. The mens rea is negligently and you kill a human being. So the example here would be that the person who dropped the bowling ball off the building that hit somebody exiting. If this person wasn't too bright uh, and they could establish that he didn't perceive the risk, then that would be negligence, and negligently killing somebody is negligent homicide, criminally negligent homicide, a lesser offense. Now, the corpus delecti, a term you sometimes hear, of a crime is a showing that the crime result occurred. So in that it would be theft and larceny, and that somebody did it. It's uh, proving that there's a death in um, uh, a murder. However, the corpus delecti is not the dead body itself, although that could constitute proof that the crime result occurred. So corpus delecti is not the body in a murder. It's being able to show that the criminal result, theft in a larceny, uh, you know, a burnt car in arson, or a dead body uh, in murder, et cetera, et cetera, actually occurred. All uh, right, so that's the end of lesson three, part two. And now it's time to proceed to lesson three, part three. And I hope that you are enjoying the course.